Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Ben Thompson, audiologist. We are here with Dr. Powell Jastroboff, PhD researcher, author, and former professor at Emory University School of Medicine. Dr. Jastroboff has been a personal mentor of mine in the world of tinnitus. He himself has been dedicated to helping patients who have tinnitus for about 40 years. Through those decades of experience and a massive impact in our field, we're going to chat with him today to learn about what are the best practices for managing tinnitus, what are the fundamentals of tinnitus retraining therapy, and how that can be applied to you. On a personal note, I have learned so much working with Dr. Jastroboff, and the tinnitus retraining therapy model is something that we use here with our patients. We use in the telehealth format, and it works very well. Dr. Jastroboff, thank you for joining. This is episode number 50 of the Treble Health Podcast. Tell us a bit about what is the best treatment for tinnitus in your opinion, and how can we use tinnitus retraining therapy? So glad to have you here. Well, obviously, since I'm propagating uh, TRT, I believe it's the best method. I'm not saying the only, and I do hope, but in future, we have something even better than TRT, but so far, and TRT is used in over 30, I don't know, five or six countries all around the world, different version. And what is interesting, what is nice, but results coming from all those countries are pretty consistent. That means we have um, anything between 70 and 90% on average 80 something percent of success rate. And what is success? How we define the success? It's not issue with just numbers, but having famous THI or TFI improved by so many points, but that tinnitus or decreased sound tolerance is not affecting life of a patient in significant manner and it's not affecting at all. So in putting this in other words, we do not have a cure for tinnitus from the meaning of patient not hearing tinnitus anymore. As a neuroscientist who is working in the auditory system since 1970, I have a strong doubts that it can be achieved because of how our auditory system is functioning. So I think that the, if we put as a goal, so-called golden silence, um, it, it's incorrect, it's misleading. But what can be achieved is possible to have effective treatment or even cure from point of view of tinnitus not affecting life, removing reactions induced by tinnitus. And this is goal of TRT, but at the end of a treatment, patient can still perceive tinnitus when they focus attention on it, and have no problem with this. And normally they are not noticing tinnitus in everyday life. And I believe that this is well, that should be goal of any method aimed on tinnitus, not just improving coping, but removing the heart of this, removing problem. Tinnitus is a problem. And tinnitus is, TRT is based on the neurophysiological model of tinnitus, which I proposed in 1980, which creates a base foundation and scientific foundation for TRT and as well allows for checking, evaluating effectiveness of tinnitus and putting stress on the different aspects once we learn it. TRT as an implementation of a model has changed during this 40, nearly 40 years of its use. And we are seeing significant improvement mainly in the duration of the time which is needed for TRT. It's one of the misconceptions is that TRT takes a lot of time uh, for professional and for patient. It's, it's incorrect. Yes, you need some time. You will not see improvement in a week or a few days. On average, people are see, patients are seeing clear improvement in three months. Some, some of them in one month, some in four months. And all treatment lasts between nine and 18 months with this nine months, which is, uh, I believe, a little bit of overkill, but I prefer to be safe, but sorry. We are not observing, and not only me, but other people, relapse of tinnitus. There was a special study done in Germany and in Italy 
showing that once patient got a once they got, got a good result with TRT, result remains stable, or even the tendency to further improving after three and five years from the treatment. So I think that this is another very positive aspect of TRT, which other methods are not uh, really showing or has not been proven. So this is why I believe that TRT is uh, the best. And again, I would like to repeat that if I know anything better than this, I will switch to it at once. I'm yes. not fine to this. I'm scientist. That's, that's true, me as well. And the habituation-based protocols I've learned from you, I've learned from experience, the habituation-based protocols are the best. That is our goal. That is what we should be striving for. You have helped thousands of people, absolutely. And as well as the professionals who have trained under you have also helped many people. It is true, correct, that there are treatments for tinnitus and bothersome loud tinnitus after time, after counseling, after using sound therapy can improve significantly. Tell us about this, about the people you've helped over the decades. And I imagine that's why you keep coming back to it. That's why you've worked so many years in this, because it's helping people in, in a very real way. Um, I have to confess that for half of my working life, I was not very nice from point of view of recognizing importance of uh, clinical work. I was so-called basic scientist, you know, lab scientist who was looking on everything and everything which has any kind of a practical implication as an inferior or not worth really considering. I was working on cerebellum, auditory system, vestibular system, pain, smell, many different things with a main interest on brain plasticity. It was always something which was core of my work. And until 1983, when Professor Clarence Sasaki was chairman of EMT at Yale University, uh, when I was on my sabbatical from Polish Academy of Sciences, told me that, um, you know, Pavel, basic research is fine, but clinical research, it's something which is, from one point of view, much more difficult because you are looking to, to see the positive results on the patient. And as well as something which directly have an impact, hopefully positive impact on life of a patient. And it, it struck me because I always, for all my life, like thing, to do things which other people were considering impossible. Like for example, creating animal model of tenet. When I created this, everybody believed it's absolutely impossible by definition. Now we have over 20 models, majority of them based on my initial model. And it was a challenge for me to do something which is impossible. And Clarence convinced me that indeed science, which has a clinical part and working with patients is very important. And once I start seeing patients in 1990, personally, and once I start seeing positive results of my work, I got addicted to this. And because of this, I'm still seeing patients, although I'm formally and legally. Professor Emeritus of Otolaryngology had an ex surgeon at uh, Emory University, Atlanta, Georgia. I'm still seeing patients even today. And seeing patients whose life got converted, hearing from patients, and not only from patients, but from their families, how much positive impact my work might have, keep me working, although I should, I should just stay and enjoy life. And I remember a few saying from a patient, literally seven years old boy, who, is, who told me, thank you very much for giving my dad back to me. It was absolutely, he was like not, not present. I, it was sad to see him. Patient was saying, well, thank you very much. You saved my life. I was like a 10 years in prison and now I can do everything and anything without any problem. So this kind of a statements are extremely strong. Obviously, there are some patients I cannot help, but in reality, probably it's about 10% of a patient whom I cannot help at all or very little, and they are belonging to certain categories of a patient I can predict with a quite high level of accuracy, but there is that I cannot help this particular patient. From other, 
well, it's, you never know in medicine, even if it's a broken finger, but you get a 100% success rate. But indeed, having over 80% success rate is, is very satisfactory to me. And of course, I'm biased by seeing these cases when patients are saying, well, you saved my life. Not necessarily literally, although maybe in some cases, but what one of my patients told me, uh, I was a surgeon uh, who was, I believe, helping people, uh, cancer people, and saving their life. And I told him, you know, you are doing a really important thing because you are saving, uh, saving life of a patient. And he told me, no, Pavel, it's, you're, you're wrong because I can save the life of a people, but you are saving quality of a life. You are giving patient back normal life when previously their life was preserved. And it took me experiences of being in that position of helping someone and having those same stories that made me fully believe tinnitus retraining therapy works. It made me fully believe in habituation. It showed me that tinnitus can reduce in the perception in how often, how much it bothers us, that it can improve. And oftentimes the volume can get softer too through that process. Not always, it's not necessary, but it can happen. That message is not shared if someone goes on the internet, that's not what they find. In fact, they find the contrary. If they go to the average ENT doctor, the ENT clinic, they will get a message of, sorry, nothing to do, nothing I can help with. So that is our first main message here, Powell, that we can help patients. And I learned this from you. I learned this from, from you know, the, the mentors and the scientific uh, community who's helped me with this. Now, what is the fundamental approach of the counseling of the professional one-on-one -on -one time with a patient why is that so important because i'm sure you've asked yourself does this really need to happen between a professional and a patient is there another way that an individual can habituate or is there a better way why is it that one-on-one -on -one is your recommendation and and what other information is relevant here well, it's an excellent question. First of all, I would like to briefly comment on about this loudness of tinnitus. Indeed, on average, patients are experiencing decrease of a perceived loudness of tinnitus to about half. Uh, some more, some a little bit less, but it's as a rule, and it has a, actually a good physiological explanation why it is happening. Perceived loudness of tinnitus is decreasing as a result of uh, TRT. And as well, and we published paper, Dr. Hazel, I think 1994, 95, in healing research, showing that when you achieve successful treatment of tinnitus with TRT, it's not only loudness going down, but as well, it's easier to suppress or make tinnitus weaker. It's just, you can think that in auditory system, you have like a filters that are tuned to uh, tinnitus, and then after TRT, they get broader, so less of external sound is enough to affect tinnitus perception. Not necessarily masking, not necessarily covering, but tinnitus perception. And it was over 500 patients, I think it was quite powerful data. Now, regarding counseling and one counseling, individual counseling is so important. You can do part of a counseling in like a group or general, general information but it will be not as effective. TRT, because of, again, what model is teaching us, need to take into account individual patient. It's not exactly the same counseling for every patient, but you need to take into account what is happening with the patient and why. Uh, TRT, in a nutshell, it's a retraining brain, literally retraining brain, teaching brain to do new tricks, teaching brain to do something differently that it was done previously, and teaching these change, those changes at subconscious level, over which we do not have a conscious control. You can think more that's uh, similar to learning how to play golf differently, or how to drive bicycle, or motorcycle, or even drive a car. It's retraining condition reflex based activity, which is happening at subconscious level. So as a part of a doing this, because we cannot just change this by thinking, well, I cannot think, I, I know this is nothing important. I'm not going to get deaf or so. It, it's just sound. Why, why should I bother? I'm not going to hear it. 
it will definitely positively not work. It will be like proverbal. I'm not going to think about pink elephants. What we'll be doing, we'll be thinking about pink elephants. So the problem is that since, and I did some study on over 300 patients, which result of a show, but actually in chronic tinnitus, the problem is in this subconscious connection and not in the conscious thinking connection, or like a two loops, one of the thinking conscious and one subconscious. And it turned out very loud and clear that it is subconscious connection which are responsible for our problem. And again, this connection we cannot change easily directly. We cannot just do something and it's gone. You need to use other methods. And what I'm using, I'm using combination of the methods is starting from the, what we learn from Pavlov conditioning who created the concept of conditioning flexes. And even more what I learned from Professor Connors, I happen to be last student graduate student. I got a PhD from Konorski just before when, when he died, unfortunately. And Konorski was student and competitor of Pavlov. He actually invented what is known now here as a operant conditioning, which he was calling conditioning flexes, um, as well as create the term, which we are now using for thinking brain plus, it was Konorski who coined, coined this term in, in 1940s. And my, my PhD thesis was about auditory projection to cerebellum, electrophysiology, electrical activity of the brain, and I hate condition reflexes. And I was arguing with Konorski all the time. I was stupid and brave enough to do it, and he was man of an iron fist. Nobody was arguing with him, really, uh, but I, I was doing this somehow, survive it. And through this, through this discussion, I learned deeper about condition reflexes and what to do, how to change them, how to deal with so-called superstitious condition reflexes, or how important it is to consider a complex condition stimuli and so on and so forth, which later on, many, many years later, I use in practical implementation uh, in, in TRT. So because of this, without going into the old detail, patients need to understand tinnitus or decreased sound trance very deeply. So the subject becomes bad, unpleasant and so on, but so-called boring. It's nothing more to think about. There are no more questions about this. And to achieve this, you have to have a very deep conversation and counseling with patients, which is sometimes called direct counseling. You are passing knowledge to the patient. Counseling session TRT is to a large extent teaching, and you are working with a patient like with a partner. It's not just you are giving lecture, ex cathedra, and that's it. You need to discuss things with a, with a patient. And because of this, one on one counseling is so important. And it's a one, it's a, another very well recognized, established rule in our behavior that if you are exposed to a situation with a known danger, our reaction, anxiety, and everything is less than if we are exposed to unknown danger. If you're in a dark room and I don't know what's going on, have a, you know that probably some dog or something which can attack you, and, but you have no idea what's going on, well, this you are getting up, up to the limit of your reaction. If you know exactly what is going on, what might be happening, but it's just dog, nothing, nothing else, you'll be still unhappy, still anxiety, but not as big. And it was very nicely as well put into the uh, famous Edgar Allan Poe, one of his uh, no not novels, uh, stories with a pendulum. And it is just going this direction and showing if we know the danger, if we understand danger, by definition, we start reacting less. And this is part of a TRT counseling. It's not all, but part of it. And when you say reacting less, it's important for us to remember, this is not my choice, a reaction of emotion or something. This is a deep brain reaction, which is happening all the time as we have all this sensory information coming through, correct? Exactly. The issue is that we can control our behavior, what we are doing, but we're not, well, we cannot control our feeling, our emotion. If you see snake on the floor, you can do whatever, but if you know that it's a poisonous snake, for example, you have all fear, fight or fright reaction, if you like it or not. The same 
condition reflexes, the creating of condition reflexes, which are creating problems with tinnitus, are outside of our control. Because one of the fundamental rules of condition reflexes is that you do not need to have any logical connection between stimulus, for example, sound, and something uh, that happening to it. it can be purely by, by chance. It's enough that two things are happening at the same time to create reflex. And even if we know, if we know this mechanism, we cannot defend ourselves from creating this reflex. But if we don't know this principle, the situation is even worse. That explains why one-on-one -on -one counseling and that educational component between the professional and the patient is so important. It's something that we believe in. Our audiologists have appointments just like that. The other major part of tinnitus retraining therapy is a comprehensive sound therapy program. Sound therapy. Dr. Jastrobov, how did you come up with this theory that sound therapy could help? And what have you found over the decades of implementation and adjusting the protocols for the recommendations? Sound therapy works on the number of a different dimensions. It's not just simple, it's not, for example, distraction or so as people are claiming. And actually the fundamental part of, of any sound therapy is based on well-established uh, neurophysiological neuroscience. Fact is outside of any discussion, but all our sensory judgment of sensory stimulus, for example, light, sound or so, the same as uh, within the brain perception of a strength of a stimulus depends on the different the background. And it's like this, but if you take a small candle, I just happen to have a candle here because I like it. And if this candle, which is not powerful, it's like a birthday candle, was put in the room, which is totally dark, the light of this candle would appear to be much brighter, but even now when I have some light coming through the, through the window. And part of this is adaptation, but, but part is because Again, all our senses are judging strength of a stimulus and reacting as comparing with sound of the background. So, exactly the same sound of tinnitus. And what is, is, there is, sorry, I should correct myself. There is no such a thing like a sound of tinnitus. It's absolutely real perception of a sound, which is perception of neuronal activity within our auditory system, which we perceive as a sound. There is no vibratory activity in our inner ear or outside, which can be linked with tinnitus. Tinnitus is phantom auditory perception with a meaning, but perception is absolutely real, the same as a phantom limb or phantom pain, but there is no physical sound outside. So strength of a signal within the brain will depend how much of this background neuronal activity is going on. And this background neuronal activity, which is part of this is spontaneous, it's running all the time, but part of this is evoked by external sounds. So by controlling level of external sounds, you can control the level of a tinnitus signal. And the goal, what, what is in TRT, we're not trying to suppress, to mask tinnitus signal, which in practical terms is not possible for longer period of time, more than maybe 10% of a patient, maybe 15. But we're trying to make it consistently weaker. And I like analogy, for example, for a patient as example of the old style vaccination against flu, not which we have against COVID, it's a different principle. And what's happening in this case of, of another vaccination? You are just injecting subject with a weak virus or weak, weak bacteria, or even that, and body learn how to fight this much weaker virus or bacteria or that bacteria, create antibody. So when we are exposed to a full strength virus, well, you are not sick or sick much less. So in this case, what we are doing, we are exposing brain to the weaker tinnitus signal consistently for a long period of time, weeks or months. So brain learn how to control, how to block the signal. And when you remove this extra helper with this external sound, it's fine. So because of this, but the easiest way of achieving this is through this ear level devices that are so frequently used. Additionally, in case of a tinnitus, about 80% of the patient have some hearing loss and help with the hearing is expanding the 
frequency range and extent of a stimulation of auditory system. So because of this, sound therapy is, is helpful. It's a one of the reasons, not, not the only one. And as well, uh, ear level devices are, can be so useful. And again, in case of audiologists, but specialists in this. So it's uh, easier for them. Psychologists cannot do it. For example, cannot really implement the use of instrumentation. But I would like to stress it's not all. Uh, you have other components. You have a components of a control. For example, patient with decreased sound tolerance can use changing of this level as a creating shield between themselves and external sounds at the different thickness. The same case of a tinnitus. Tinnitus is changing, but first of all, the level which patient can take the sound, this level which is inducing NIS, is changing from day to day. So in TRT, it's a crucial that patients have power of changing the sound level at everyday basis. And limiting this, like unfortunately happened in some of the clinical study to only four decibels is a big mistake. And basically, if you're doing this limiting, you don't have a TRT. You have some method which is in counseling, and counseling is always helpful, providing that's a good counseling through bad counseling will actually make the situation worse. But giving patient feeling of control is helpful as well. Last but not least, in case of misophonia, that means reaction to specific pattern, specific to a given patient, patient pattern of sound, like eating, clicking, or, or whatever else, or voice, music is frequently used because of a specific effect of music has on us. And again, there are certain rules, how this music should be selected, how to apply this, and so on and so forth, with special protocol, so-called protocol level one for misophonia. But again, music is used as well. So if a different type of a sound, and depending on the specific situation of a patient, specific case of a sentence, patient using different type or different mixture of this, of this uh, approaches with sound. Yes, I'm happy to say that since studying formal tinnitus retraining therapy with you for tinnitus, for hyperacusis, my personal quality, my personal standard of care has increase and I've seen the benefit it has to patients. Now, we, we may be listening to this and thinking, okay, so one on one professional counseling, that's very focused, very focused on this conditioning on this brain retraining, right, that's very specific, plus comprehensive sound therapy that's set up by an audiologist, that is the method that is the foundational approach here. One thing that breaks my heart is when I see or meet people who have tried all these different alternative therapies or experimental treatments, yet they have not been educated or they have not tried the foundational approach of tinnitus retraining therapy, of professional counseling, plus dedicated sound therapy. Would you agree that that is the foundation? From there, it's possible to try different things like more relaxation-based approaches or other things, but we must first have this strong foundation and there must be a professional who's guiding the individual, the patient along the way. Would you agree with that? Yes, I agree with this. And I would like to point out that there's nothing wrong with using what I'm calling adjunct therapy, relaxation, mindfulness, or whatever else, can help by making process of retraining brain easier. It's more difficult to retrain patient who is at the end of a rope and who is uh, extremely unhappy and cannot do anything and think about anything but tinnitus. So it's helpful, but stress release therapy and so on are not sufficient by itself. As an adjunct can be great. And one of the problems which we are facing but many patients all around the world, but particularly in the United States, are going the direction of um, medication. And medications, majority of medication are just not really bad. All medication have negative side effects, but for like antidepressants, so side effects are, are not very really bad. The problem which I have, and it's a big problem, is, is issue of benzodiazepines, Xanax, clonopine, Valium, and so on. And why? I, I'm not even getting into this, but they are addictive, changing personality, and so on and so forth. They can promote suicide, even or facilitate suicide tendencies, but they are decreasing brain plasticity. And what TRT, an actual method which has any component of interacting counseling patient have, is that you need to have a brain 
plastic can change, can learn. And uh, it's very nicely shown in, in case of uh, um, TRT as well. Children who have a very plastic brain are doing extremely well in TRT. Very fast recovery, a very big recovery. Why elderly, slower, so to speak, range of my patient is from 5 to 95 years old. Um, and patients on benzodiazepines are showing recovery much slower. And even the high dose of benzodiazepine, let's say 2 milligrams of Xanax per day, uh, the chances of help of this patient is, is very remote. It's one of the categories of a patient which is in this 10% or so patient who, uh, whom I cannot help. If somebody is in the high level of benzodiazepines, it's really practically impossible. Yes, and I, again, the problem mm. is that one third of my patients are coming to me on benzo. And I cannot do anything with this, I'm not MD, but I can refer them to MD who is prescribing this medication. So they, patient and this MD can discuss and decide what's the uh, approach. It's an important topic. It's a very important topic. And thank you for explaining that. Dr. Jastrobov, you have written a book about tinnitus retraining therapy. I, I can recommend that as a good resource for patients who want to read about these fundamental principles. Additionally, if individuals are looking for that one-on-one -on -one counseling or that tinnitus retraining therapy, find an audiologist who has been properly trained. You can reach out to our team. You can find our team at Treble Health, or you can reach out to the online community where there is a resource center for audiologists who have been trained in tinnitus retraining therapy. Please contact us. We can help you find that if you're looking for that information. Dr. Jastrobov, what is the last message you have for our community here? I want to personally thank you for saying yes to this invitation and for joining me for the 50th podcast episode here on the Treble Health Podcast. It's a pleasure to have you. I love your science background. I love your dedication to this field. And some people have frustration because there is no cure. There is no fast, quick treatment for tinnitus. But let us not confuse that you and many other scientists have dedicated years and focus and a lot of work into trying to solve this problem, trying to get closer into the best practice, the best treatment available. So from everyone who has had tinnitus or who currently does, I say thank you. And I want to pass it to you to share any last words with our community here. I think that the most important thing to remember is that a lot can be done. And I believe that TRT can give patients more than other methods. But other methods, even just using sound, can be helpful. It's one thing. Second, it's important to do these things combined as a part of a structured program. For example, I'm against approach which you have uh, typically in literature, but trying to separate effect of counseling and effect of sound therapy. It's for me a little bit like a trying to, trying to uh, analyze separately uh, role of oxygen and hydrogen in water. You know, oxygen and hydrogen is a totally different uh, feature. If you combine them and got a water, water has a totally different properties with hydrogen and oxygen separately. It's not perhaps as dramatic, but I believe that interaction and combined effect of counseling and sound therapy, this is what is giving power of uh, uh, TRT. But again, most important thing is to remember that a lot can be done. And I again, I would argue, we do not have a cure for perception of tinnitus, but we, I believe we do have a cure for tinnitus as a problem, and this which counts. And once patients are not suffering because of a tinnitus, classical example of this is one of my patients, one of my special patients, whom I'm allowed to talk about, William Shatner, Captain Kirk, taught me something which really stick in my brain as a very nice, very elegant uh, presentation. He's extremely intelligent man. I do not have, he's not my patient, was my patient 95 or so, for ages he's in perfect shape, although his tinnitus was substantial. And I had, a, I don't know, some contact with him a few years ago. He was referring to me somewhat or so. Then I asked him, so how is your tinnitus, Bill? How are you doing? And he told me, you know, I'm not bothered at all. And I'm perceiving this maybe 10, maybe 20% of the time. And it's happening only 
when somebody on the Star Trek convention is grabbing me and telling about their tenets. And I know as well, this from my own example, I'm not perceiving my tenets at all, except when I'm talking about this or talking about a patient, and even then, not always. I have a very small proportion of it, and I can hear it if I focus attention, although sometimes I even cannot hear it even then. And this is state which we can achieve with a patient. And I believe that this is, which is as good cure as you can imagine. Cure to tinnitus as a problem, not tinnitus as a something which you perceive. And education, both professions and general population, extremely important. It's a coincident factor, but we just had the last year 50 course, TRT course in the United States. We have more than 70 abroad, but it was 50 course of TRT. So we have a 50 number for you, 50 for us as well. And the same as you have a more, hopefully we have a, again, a few more courses, TRT courses uh, for teaching professionals how to use TRT to treat tinnitus and hyperacusis patients. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Jastrobov. If you are watching this on YouTube and you enjoyed this conversation, find it in the comments and write, thank you, Dr. Jastrobov. I will hope thank to speak you. with you soon nice to and have a wonderful day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.